And now uh, to um, bookend this smorgasbord <laughs> of literary uh, delights is a true uh, literary legend. I'm very honored to be on the panel with him. He's a lovely man as well as being an amazing writer. He's also a Celt, so we are bonded in some primal way <laughs> forever. Please welcome the lovely Mr. Colm Tobin. Thank you. It's lovely being up so early in the morning. Isn't it? It's good. Um, a few years ago, when my novel Brooklyn came out, um, I was doing a reading in New York University, and I was signing books afterwards, and a woman was standing there, and she held out her book to be signed, and she said to me, I, I think this book is about my mother. And I looked at her, and I said, oh, oh you mean your mother was Irish and married an Italian? And she said, well, yes, but I think it's actually about her. And whatever way she looked, and there was a young man behind her who was much taller and bigger than I was, sort of looking at me as well, who I thought maybe was the woman's son. And I said, she said, no, I think it's my mother. And I said, what was your mother's name? And she said a name. And I said, oh, that was your mother. And what had happened was that my father died when I was 12 and in a small town in the southeast of Ireland called Enniscorthy. And for months afterwards, the house was filled with people every evening. And the interesting part always was when somebody left the company. Everyone, and of course, I was this 12-year-old, this nightmare 12-year-old, who of course listened to everything that was said by the adults. I'd been doing so for many years at that point, and remembered everything that was said. And of course, the fun part was they would start to talk about the person who had left. It was never what they said about someone while they were there that was interesting. When they'd gone, it was interesting. And it was one evening this woman had come to the house, this old woman who I knew where she lived in Court Street in Enniscorthy. And when she had gone, someone just said, you know, her daughter, her daughter went to America. And she was coming home from America, which was very unusual at the time. I mean, there was a big difference between emigrating to America and emigrating to England, if you were Irish. If you um, emigrated to America, you could, or your descendants could, become president of the United States, as we knew with President Kennedy. But as you know, Alan, if you wanted to be, um, if your descendants, I think there's a law to stop your descendants becoming Queen of England. <laughs> you know, that it just wasn't allowed. It just, if you were Irish, you didn't become Queen eventually. You know, you didn't save up money, work hard, and become Queen of England. Um, <laughs> And so she had, she had gone to America um, and she'd come back. But of course, her family thought she was coming back for good and they were so glad that she was. But actually, her boyfriend in New York realized that if you go, you'll never come back to me. And he said, look, marry me before you go and then it'll be all right. And she did. And of course, um, on the boat, she had a ring. But once she got off the boat, as she was getting off the boat in Ireland, she took off the ring because she just couldn't tell them that she was married in America because that would mean that she would never um, be um, able to stay in Ireland, that, that she would go back to America. Um, my father was a teacher in the town and he used to talk, um, I mean, everywhere I would go for years, people would tell me a story he would tell, especially if you were very stupid, as some people in our town, I mean, I hesitate to admit this, yeah, they weren't very smart, and uh, my father didn't know what to do with them because uh, he was a teacher, you know, and he would say to them, look, there's no problem about being stupid. Um, there, was, there, was, there was somebody stupid before you, and um, his, father, his father was a grave digger in the town, and then when his father died, he wanted to be the grave digger, and they said, that's fine, you know, obviously you can dig, but can you read and write? And he said, no, no, I never learned that part. And he said, well, you can't be a grave digger because you dig the wrong graves for people and that will be proved to be a sort of disaster, you know. So he went to America where you go in that situation. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, thank you for your wonderful hospitality. And, and um, so eventually he went to Texas. I'll come to Texas again in a minute. He, he, he came to Texas and he bought a small piece of land. And of course, he found oil on the land. And of course, he became, um, he 
bought more land and there was more oil and more land with more oil. It was all oil. And eventually he became one of the richest men in America and therefore one of the richest men, as you know, in the world. And uh, one day a man said, look, I need this deal today. I need it signed today. I need it signed now. And the man said, well, I can't sign. He said, well, why can't you? Because I can't read and I can't write. And the guy said to him, you can't, um, my father used to do this big imitation of a Texan accent saying, you can't read and you can't write and you're one of the richest men in the world. What would you be, how rich would you be if you could read and could write? So uh, I'd be a grave digger in Enniscorthy. Um, but, but in any case, in any case, the story stayed in my mind of this idea of a woman coming back to the town with the ring somewhere in her handbag, the ring in her purse, but not telling them she was married. And eventually she did, and she went back to America, and that was all I knew. Henry James is very good about this, about the idea of loving half a story. That if you're a novelist, if someone tells you an entire story, it's no use to you, because it's been completed. But if someone tells you the beginning of something, it can stay in your imagination and live there, and things can happen from it. So I was working um, in the year 2000, I started two novels. One was the novel I wrote about Henry James called The Master, and the second is the novel that's coming out now, 14 years later in October, called Nora Webster. And I, I finished The Master much more quickly. Nora Webster was proving more difficult, and every year I would add to it and take things away from it and think about it more. And in the middle of all of this, I went to live in Austin, in Texas. And I have to say, I mean, I don't know if there's anyone from Austin in Texas here, but it's more or less what Brendan Behan said about Toronto, that it'll be lovely when you finish it. You know, um, and I mean, it was nice, but I began to miss home. And, you know, things in Ireland that I don't, I mean, I don't know if anyone's witnessed Irish food, for example, but I mean, I wouldn't try it if I were you, but uh, I began to even miss Irish food or Irish politics or, you know, the peace process, all those lovely things we have in Ireland, or, you know, and um, Irish drunkenness. Uh, and uh, I um, actually began to feel homesick. And then when I went back home, I actually began to miss Austin and Barton Springs and hillbilly music and, you know, um, uh, um, anyway. And um, so I found that in the first chapter of the novel Nora Webster, when I went back to read it, had this tiny story about this woman who had come to visit a woman who was effectively my mother. I, I was using my own family house in the book. Uh, you know, after a death, she comes to visit and just tells this tiny story about her daughter who went to America and who obviously got married there without telling them and came home and then eventually told them and went back to America. It's just about four sentences in the book. And I was there on my own one night, and I saw these four sentences, because I was looking at the first chapter with a view to adding more to the book. And um, I realized that this was a book, that, that out of these four sentences, I could actually, using my experiences of being away, of missing home, I could actually get a book. And um, so that all I was able to tell the woman um, was that um, actually I had heard this story um, 40 years earlier in the town and um, I had used it and I, was, I hope she didn't mind and she seemed not to mind. It was her son behind me who did all the minding and looking at me and eventually he said to me, I don't like your book. I said, all oh, right, well, a lot, you know, there, I mean, there are other books you can buy, you know, there are many other <laughs> books and um, he said, um, you know, because I've been in your town a lot and I really like all the bars in your town, the Stamps and, you know, the Slaney Inn and the Rafter Inn, and he began to name all the pubs in the town. He said, you didn't put all those into your book. You should have, because they're really great pubs. And I said, yeah, no, the, ne the next book I'll put, I'll name all the pubs in the town. He said, okay, well, that's fine. So that was the end of that. What happened then was that um, this year, um, at the end of March, they began to film Brooklyn in the town. And people in the town thought that they had chosen the town because of its beauty, or because, you know, it, it somehow or other was an immensely filmable town. It was like Hollywood or something. But actually it's because nothing much has changed since the 1950s in certain streets in the town. 
And the strange thing at the beginning was, the first morning was a Monday morning. And um, as Martin will know from Cross Maglen, if there's anyone around an Irish town at six o'clock in the morning, they're usually coming from somewhere. <laughs> and they've been in quite a lot of other places on the way to where they are now. And they will eventually make it home. But they couldn't believe that all the actors were up and the crew and everyone was working at six o'clock in the morning. And then the second thing they couldn't believe was that the, um, um, there was a scene set in the Irish Sea. And that these glamorous actors, led by Stier Sharonan, who was the young actress who, who, who had been in Atonement, for example, or the Grand Hotel Budapest, that there she was, she was going to have to get into the Irish Sea in early April and stay in there and get filmed in there. The whole town was talking about this as to whether they're going to use extras or who was going to do it. But actually, they discovered that these actors were going to be forced. I mean, can you imagine it? Forced to get into the IRC and stay in there and get filmed in there, cavorting as though it was high summer. Even in high summer, you wouldn't put a dog into the IRC. <laughs> and, you know, that they were going to have to go there. And um, that... Um, but as they were filming, I was here in New York and I was working on the proofs, I was doing the final corrections to the novel Nora Webster, which is set in those very same streets that in the time after, when I talked about all the visitors coming to the house after my father died, my mother went back to work. And it's funny having a, having a memory for those years. There's almost nothing I've forgotten. That every, again, Henry James used the phrase that a novelist is someone on whom nothing is lost. But also a novelist is a great listener and rememberer. And so that every single thing that happened in those few years after my father died, as we tried to put the family back together again, as my mother went back to work, as she came home every day from work, describing things that had happened at work, and as we watched her very carefully and listened to everything she said in case something else was going to happen in the house, the problem was how much to use and how much to actually leave out. And one of the advantages, I suppose, um, or one of the things that is nice about New York, um, I don't know if you feel this as well, um, is that it's not England, you know. Um, <laughs> that you go to, that you go, I mean, I know you're going to separate from England, it's so nice, you just, you've got to join these wonderful little, you know, um, vote yes, um, vote often, vote early. Um, but um, the, um, the idea that when you go to London, people say, oh, you're Irish, it's so marvellous, you're all writers, you're all, all of you are writers, and, and you're all marvellous storytellers, it's how marvellous, you all tell a story, with so, isn't it so wonderful, it must be so wonderful over there. Now, did you get, did you get the stories from your grand, I mean, was it your grandmother, or was it, how do you know all those wonderful stories? And you just go, and you go, if only they knew, if only they knew what it's like at home. That, that in other words, that the men, I think it's the same in Scotland, generally just sit around watching everybody, <laughs> saying very, very little. Either saying, turn up the television, or turn it off, turn off the television. And the women do all the talking. And, and I think if you're a novelist, it's very interesting to watch this. And I think it's the same in Scotland, and it's certainly the same in Cross Madlen, where, where your family is from. I don't know about where you're from, but where, <laughs> where you begin to notice, because you've been listening to the conversation earlier, that there's something that's really on everyone's mind and that no one is talking about it. Everyone is talking about something else. And that idea of a silence that lingers of something that's between the words, that matters more than the words, I think is a very good training for a novelist, where one half, the men, are just silent, watching, resentful, strange. You want to be very careful with them. And on the other side, the women, who are doing all the managing, all the talking, but in the meantime, there's something big going on, and no one will ever mention it. And in a way, that becomes a very useful metaphor for the reader in a novel. That, that the person who's reading a novel actually knows the story, knows what's really going on in people's minds. Because the novel uniquely can do that, can enter into someone's spirit 
enter into their minds, give you their memories, and then give you what they're actually saying. And the reader can see the distance between those two things. So that you work, instead of working out of storytelling or working out of speech, you work out of silence. And in this novel that's coming in October, Nora Webster, I'm trying to work again with that idea of the distance between speech and silence and the distance between how people want to live in a small town and the way a small town can actually both confine you and nourish you. Thank you very much. Thank you.